Hello and welcome to today's seminar, XRF in the petrochemical industry from a refinery feedstock to fuels and lubricants. My name is Frank Portala and I'd like to guide you through today's seminar. First of all, I'd like to give you a short outlook about the seminar. So after a short introduction to XRF, we will show you how to optimize your refinery process. From there, we will switch to the lab and show you the benefits of pearlized EDXRF, including some tips and tricks for sample preparation of petrochemical products. And then from there, we will cover the topic about lubricants from basic to high performance. And then back in the lab again, we will cover the lubricant analysis with WDXRF followed by a short summary, and then we will switch over to our Q&A session with our experts. Today's speakers are Kai Behrens and Adrian Fiege from our XF product management team in Karlsruhe, and then Renata Janic from the application lab here in Karlsruhe. And with this, I'd like already to hand over to our speakers, Kai and Adrian. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Frank, uh, and also a warm welcome from my side. My name is Kai Behrens, and with me today is Adrian Fiegel. Yeah, hello, and also a very warm welcome from my side. Welcome to this seminar. Yeah. yeah, today we want to talk about the optimization of a refinery process and understand how XRF as an analytical technique can help you uh, to speed up your process and to be cost efficient in your daily routine. So, looking first, uh, low sulfur is required to be analyzed across the globe, across the process, because we want to reduce the uh, sulfur coming from combustibles. And the reason is simply because of environmental reasons. So, therefore, there's a lot of uh, tax and legislation in place uh, in order to reduce uh, the limits. Typically, we are going uh, to limits below 10 ppm. Uh, there are some countries with, which are still at a higher level or some different fuel types like uh, heavy fuel, which uh, still allows higher levels in the upper ppm range. Nevertheless, it's of global concern and the reduction of sulfur is pretty critical and it's a cost driver. So therefore, accurate and precise uh, daily analyze is uh, important. A reduction of 1 ppm will lead to a uh, uh, saving of more than $1 million per year, and this is quite huge. So let us have a closer look. So there are different uh, analytical methods uh, we can select. Uh, on the one hand, it starts with the analytical results. They must be accurate and they must be traceable, uh, be comparable be, uh, between the process labs and also the labs along the shipping of the fuel. So uh, they need to be therefore norm compliant and especially for low and ultra low sulfur fuels like in gasoline. And there are a lot uh, of ASTM and ISO norms available some require AAS or ICP OES, but um, they are quite uh, labor intensive and uh, consumable intensive. So uh, often require daily recalibration and a lot of sample preparation. So therefore, uh, we see that uh, XRF is actually in, uh, offering a great deal of uh, uh, lower cost of ownership. And it's pretty nice because it's just a one-time uh, calibration with no need for extensive sample preparation. And they are compliant uh, for all materials with the international norms. So have a closer look there then. Yeah, Adrian, uh, let's go ahead and explain, please, uh, the, the XRF as a method here. Yeah, thank you, Kai, so for providing us this overview of why we actually do elemental analysis uh, and why XRF is a tool that's now for me to cover. For those who are not so familiar with XRF, just a few words. So this is a very simplified uh, design here. So we see that we have an X-ray uh, um, source, X-ray uh, tube in this case, irradiating your sample. What happens is that an inner shell electron gets kicks, kicked out of the sample, of the atoms within the sample, 
and then an outer shell electron falls into the vacancy and we are emitting uh, so-called fluorescing photons. And these fluorescing photons uh, can then be uh, collected and we, so we can count the photons, we can even separate them in a wavelength dispersive system, for example, based on their wavelength, or we can uh, count uh, their energy in an energy dispersive system. And this allows us then these counts that we're collecting for a given energy or wavelength are proportional to the concentration, so we are also independent of, of uh, the boundary uh, binding um, um, neighbor in, in the material, and we are also relatively uh, matrix uh, independent. And so therefore we can measure relatively precise and also with minimal efforts on, on the sample preparation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so broadly speaking, there are uh, two different uh, technologies out here. You see here on the left-hand side, so on, on Kai's side, basically, um, energy dispersive system, in this case, a polarized system, uh, where we use a secondary mm -hmm. target also to fine-tune the incoming beam, especially for, for petrochemical applications here. Um, so it's a relatively compact device. Uh, with a couple good features that we will uh, show you later um, for, for the petrochemical applications. Yeah. Yeah. But the main purpose here is since we are going to ultra-low sulfur levels, yeah. we need really a reduced background. And this is actually why we use here a special setup in, uh, uh, with, uh, like you mentioned, a secondary target, mm -hmm. which reduces the background dramatically and enables trace or ultra-low sulfur level analysis. Yeah. So for this, you need a really dedicated target that also reduces the background for this particular area, so especially sulfur, chlorine, and so on. Yeah. So in wavelength dispersive systems, you, you, you do this quite differently. Uh, you basically uh, separate uh, the, the photons based on their wavelengths. So you see that the setup is also much more complex here. Uh, we have a goniometer, um, which basically uh, the heart of the instrument is the heart of the instrument where we have analyzer crystals that allow us to separate uh, the incoming photons based on their wavelengths. So this creates, first of all, um, a very high a spectral resolution and also a better signal-to-noise ratio. On top, um, these wavelength dispersive systems come also with, with much higher power, They're available as a benchtop system, 400 watt, and then up to 4 kilowatt for a large floor standing unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the under basic uh, difference here is also that the energy dispersive systems are analyzing simultaneously a mm -hmm. range of elements. So you get, at the same time, you get uh, several elements, but not as precise or accurate. And the uh, wavelength dispersive XRF actually measures sequentially in our case, but the advantage is it can be optimized for each element individually. Exactly, yeah. So... We want to start with, uh, with a couple norms here, uh, just to give you an overview there. As Kai mentioned, there are several ASTM and ISO norms available for different applications. Here, the first focus of our, um, of our overview of applications is the ultra-low sulfur application, because this is really something where uh, XRF excels and where XRF also allows to, to reduce uh, your costs substantially. The reference method here on the very right-hand side, uh, uh, so on my side, is basically uh, the UV method. And then you can see here um, the, the three core examples for XRF. That's the ASTM D2622 for the wavelength dispersive system. And then, uh, for instance, the ASTM 7220 for the polarized energy dispersive system. Um, I would like to spend a few words on, on the polarized systems, but before we do that, maybe a few words on sample preparation. Mm -hmm. So Kai, handling a sample here is really easy. We don't need digestion. That's, that's the very big point here. We don't need sample digestion. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we have a liquid sample cup. You see this here in, in the pictures, actually consisting of uh, two uh, plastic rings and then there is in between a small uh, foil depending on the uh, sample type. So we have either mylar or proline foil for lubricating oils. And then you simply fill up something in the range of 7 milliliter or 7 gram. You don't need any dilution or digestion. It's also not required to be very accurate here with the weighing. And then you simply load the sample like we see it on the right-hand side uh, manually. There are also auto-changer uh, instruments available. 
And this is basically all you need to, uh, to do. You yeah. can assemble the cups by yourself or buy from us uh, the, the already prepared cups. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, um, yeah, your choice. But actually, it's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Yes, and Renata later in the lab will show you how to do that. So you can see it really in real life. <clears throat> the first example we want, application example we want to bring here is for the 7220 uh, for the S2 Polar. So this is a relatively um, broad range uh, sulfur concentrations, but going also to uh, ultra low sulfur concentrations. So the calibration range is here 3 to almost 1000 uh, ppm of sulfur in automotive fuel. You can see here uh, on Kai's side um, the spectra. You can see, for example, that we um, get even very low. Uh, uh, background here, so even the blank can be differentiated easily from uh, a 5 ppm sulfur standard. And if we then measure here, for example, a QC sample here on my side um, with, with 10 ppm inside, we really get extraordinary uh, um, precision, uh, so even to the sub ppm level. So this then allows you really to optimize your processes, make sure you get the sulfur content down, but only as much as, uh, as needed by the norm, so to yeah. save, save mm -hmm. money. Most importantly, you see here, that's the blank sample, and what we explained, the, the background is dramatically reduced, so it, it, uh, it's really differentiated from the 5 ppm sample, so that's a clear indication that's a very powerful detection method. Yeah. Um, but the, the S2 polar, that, that was the example we just brought, so for our polarized energy dispersive system, can also do a bit more Kai, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing uh, in petrochemical is that we are not just analyzing sulfur, but other elements are important as well, like chlorine. When we are burn burning uh, the, the chlorine, it forms uh, hydrochloric uh, acid, which will lead to corrosion. But there are also other elements uh, coming from the process, like the catalyst residues from the fluid cracking catalyst. And so then, therefore we don't want to lose those and they would have a negative impact uh, so, uh, or silicon. So um, there are instruments, single element analyzers on the market, but they are failing on those additional elements, which are as well pretty important. And uh, the nice thing on S2 Polar is, and as I explained, uh, it, it uh, analyzes a wide range. So at the same time, we can use the analyzer also for other elements, like here the chlorine in crude oil, uh, which uh, really goes to similar low levels. We have here 5 ppm and have a relative standard deviation of uh, below 2%. So that's very accurate, very re uh, yeah, repeatable. And uh, it covers the, the calibration can cover a range of 1 to uh, 100 ppm. So it's uh, comparable with uh, 4929, right? Yeah. And a very important point, as he has mentioned, is the crude oil uh, norm. So th just to emphasize, we are covering in the entire process. So we are starting from the crude to the fully refined uh, product. And the yeah. same device uh, can help you there. Uh, maybe hear a few more words about that. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the, the, the interesting thing here is that uh, we have very uh, excellent reproducibility and accuracy, what you can see here when uh, looking at the rep uh, repetition. And the nice thing, it, it comes in parallel with very high sulfur concentration. So um, when we are looking at uh, lower resol resolution instruments or other methods, they would be highly influenced by the uh, variety of sulfur levels. Mm -hmm. But since we are, uh, have a very high spectral resolution and using the polarized, uh, handling the background in the right way, we actually are independent. Uh, so, so both elements can be done in the same time without any loss on, on, on accuracy or precision. Yeah, maybe there to emphasize that uh, the line that you're detecting for uh, sulfur or that we're using for the detection and chlorine sit really right next to each other. So you need the, the right XRF tool to excel that task. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, last but not least, we want to have a closer look at the catalyst uh, residues or the, the elements which are coming from the uh, geological processes here. And uh, this is an example shown vanadium, uh, nicely separated, no uh, uh, line overlays. And also here we are working in the lowest PPM range. Yeah. 
Yeah, to summarize means actually the S2 Polar uh, is a very nice instrument, process control instrument. It, uh, it comes uh, with uh, a single um, loader or an auto XY auto changer, depending on the amount of samples you have to run per shift. Um, you would see also uh, you can work in quality control and downstream at the tank terminals, depots, or at uh, remote labs uh, in a refinery. It's pretty easy to operate with uh, the touchscreen, and it comes uh, already pre-calibrated from the factory uh, for the, the most uh, uh, important norms here. And of course, you also can put your own uh, applications in there. So you see, it's a happy use case like this lady uh, is, is doing in the refinery. Yeah. <clears throat> so of course, there, there are also examples uh, when you need to do more. So at the beginning, I, I briefly spent a very few words about the wavelength dispersive system. We actually will spend more time about this also in the second part of today's uh, session. So um, when you're dealing with, with various types of samples and various applications, so you're not only looking into fuels, but also maybe into coke and, and residuals and, and cracking cast catalysts, or you want to measure also uh, wear metals down to very uh, low concentrations, then you might need extra gear, and this is what I explained at the beginning. So you might need the goniometer, which helps you to further separate, um, split up the spectra if you want so, so just focus on, on, on a single line, uh, and then get a better also signal-to-noise ratio. You might need extra power for that, uh, even going to, to a floor-standing device. And this is when uh, um, wavelength dispersive systems is often the best choice. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, we, we need to uh, also mention here that uh, we are also now uh, including uh, solid samples like uh, the pet Good coat yeah. or uh, uh, very viscous samples like bitumen. Mm -hmm. They can be analyzed in the same instrument. So mm -hmm. it can be ED or wavelength dispersive, but uh, this is something a UV instrument can't do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a very important point. So uh, a solid sample, if it's a powder, you can also put it in such a cup as we've shown if it's a powder that can also be pressed, that's more common maybe. Uh, it, it, if it's vi high viscosity, it can also be put in such a cup, or uh, Renata will show you a bit more. Um, so here just one example. So this is also uh, the, the ultra-low sulfur application. Um, there, are, there are various norms where our S6 Jaguar complies with, including the D2622 ASTM norm. We, you can see that we really meet the sulfur content far below the, the threshold, so we are not only compliant, but you can also get your um, sulfur content really tweaked uh, to, to the ultimate uh, goal um, for your processes. We have different configurations available for the S6 uh, Jaguar. You see here next to Kai, that's the, that's the single manual loader. Uh, for for if you if you just have maybe a few samples a day, or you just prepare them and measure them right away, that's often completely sufficient. If you may be dealing with different types of samples, you're pre-preparing. You want to load an entire batch. You have also an auto changer uh, there available. Yeah. And one point here. So this is really um, really nice. So point three um, um, precision and uh, lower limits of detection is here point seven for sulfur. Yeah. Uh, Important to understand uh, when looking at S2 Polar or S6 Jaguar or uh, the, the Tiger, they all will uh, do the same job, means uh, analyzing very accurately in, uh, the uh, ultra-low sulfur level in automotive fuel. Nevertheless, depending on your other range of applications, you might want to select wavelength dispersive in some way because you have different application in, in mind. So if you're just looking at uh, ultra-low sulfur and uh, some of the, the others, in S2 Polar will give the same data quality, actually. Uh, it, it just, it, it's a question which uh, method you are, you are going to use and which ASTM or ISO norm you are requested to follow, yeah. right? Uh, when talking about low sulfur, <clears throat> when we are going to further application, then it might be obvious that uh, we are selecting in, in wavelength dispersive instrument or in energy dispersive instrument. Yeah. So here just very few words um, about the, um, 
the Jaguar um, won't go too much into detail. So this is this is the chamber here of, of the Jaguar. We have also um, a vacuum seal which protects uh, the goniometer, which is very important, helps also with very low helium consumption. So if you need to measure um, 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 traces, then helium uh, uh, can, be, can be needed here. And um, this is how the XY auto changer looks like without touch control, so that option is, is also available. Um, so yeah, just maybe to, to briefly summarize uh, the refinery part, uh, downstream part uh, of, of today's session. So we have seen that we have norm-compliant analysis of low and ultra-low sulfur. Um, we covered the various important norms, A ASTM and ISO norms. Um, we have different technology available, like Kai summarized very well, the polarized energy dispersive wavelengths and the wavelength dispersive system. There are, um, of course, always the obvious sweet spots for, for both mm -hmm. technologies. We will help you to guide you to the best uh, solution for your applications. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, we would like to hand over to Renata already, who will show you the polar in action mm -hmm. and also give you some explanation about sample preparation. Hello and welcome to our today's laboratory session. Thanks to my colleagues to the studio. My name is Renata Janic. I'm working here as an application scientist for XRF in our application labs here in Karlsruhe, Germany. Today in our lab session, I would like to introduce you a little bit more detail, the S2 Polar, which is our polarized energy dispersive system for different kinds of petrochemical applications. And on the other side, I would like to tell you a little bit about applications for mineral oil samples, the use of different foils. And so let's start with some sample preparation. As you all know, there are different foils available in the market for the uh, sample preparation of these kind of liquid cups. So here we have a common liquid cup, which is used for these liquid samples. It's a three-part cup, which can be assembled manually, which is very easy. Of course, you can also buy uh, ready-to-use cups which are already prepared by different foils. For the preparation of these cups, we use this sample preparation tool, which is very nice to make sure that the surface of the foil will not touch or will not be contaminated by, for example, a lab bench or sheets. And so here you can always be sure that the foil is not contaminated by any other uh, contacts. To prepare the sample, you will just place the liquid cup here, and then you have to prepare the foil. If we talk about foils, there are different foils available. So maybe all of you know this foil on the roll, which is, let's say, less expensive than the other ones. Um, typically, in my opinion, by the end, you use more foil. So the beginning of the foil always cannot be used. So you have to cut the foil by your own. Of course, for a real sample, I would use some gloves and maybe a pincette. And then you can put the foil on the cup and prepare the sample cup. Another type of foils which are available on the market are the so-called pre-cut foils. So here the foil is already cut. They on this tray. So here you also have to be careful to remove the foil from the tray. Uh, from the tray. And then you just can start to prepare the sample. And the last type of foils are the one on these trays. Yeah. So this one I really prefer. Yes, they are more expensive, but here with this foil, it's very easy to prepare this liquid cup. And that's it. So you always have to make sure that the surface of the foil is clean, that there are no wrinkles. You should always have a short look on the sample that it's perfectly prepared. And of course, there are two types of foils. Proline foil, which is the most common foil used in these kind of mineral oil samples, or also for aqua samples, this foil can be used. And on the other side, you have to use the mylar foil due to chemical resistance in case of automotive fuels like gasoline or, for example, kerosene and diesel. But please take care. The mylar foil always has some contaminations of calcium and phosphorus, 
but luckily the software can calculate the blank of these contaminations, which can also differ from lot to lot of the mylar foil. So let's start the measurement. So I already prepared a mineral oil sample, which I filled into the liquid cup. So it's about seven gram of sample, which is used for this size of um, sample cup. To make sure the system is protected, we use this sample care cup, which is just a se second cup stringed with a proline foil. So this is just to make sure that the system stays clean, that there are no contamination. And in case of a leakage, the sample care cup will take care that the, sample, uh, that the system is not contaminated. The sample cup is just put into the sample care cup and then we will load the sample into the measurement chamber. So let's start the measurement. Here, the S2 Polar uses a touchscreen, so it's already integrated. The touchscreen is used to start the measurement, to also display the res results, but of course, an external PC is also available if necessary. But in fact, the system can be used as a standalone system in the laboratory. On the display, it's very easy to select a method. So this here, what you can see, we have different methods already pre-installed. So we use, for example, for the low chlorine analysis, the ISTM method 4929. Of course, very important for petrochemical analysis is the low sulfur analysis, like, for example, the 7220 or the ESO 13032, which can also be used for gasoline but the system can also be used for the analysis of, for example, nickel, iron and vanadium in crude oil, like defined by the ISTM D8252. And what we do quite a lot in the last few months is the analysis of phosphorus and calcium in edible oil. To start a measurement, it's very easy. Just select the method of interest. You can type in the name manually, or you can also use a barcode scanner. And that's it. To start the measure, measurement, you just push the green button and the measurement is started. So here we have a manual system. So the sample is loaded manually. It's a one position system. But in case you also want to have an XY table, like you maybe also know it from the S2 Puma, this is also available. So we have this kind of tray where the liquid cups are loaded to the sample cups. This tray is also a protected tray, so to make sure that the XY table is not contaminated by oil, so you can easily clean it. And by the way, this one is also available for the S2 Puma. So thanks for your attention. Let's see you back again in the second session. Yeah, thank you, Renata, for this excellent presentation of the S2 Polar. Now we're here for the second uh, session where we will talk about lubricant applications. Yeah, so uh, this is actually the next big uh, topic uh, in applications, talking uh, about petrochemical applications. It's uh, lubricants, and it's a pretty huge market. And uh, it's, on the one hand, uh, very small scale. We are reducing the friction uh, between engine parts. Uh, uh, they are influencing the uh, life of engines, so therefore also cost important. Um, and on the global scale, it's a pretty big business, because we are using uh, uh, lubricants, uh, even in electric vehicles, but also in a lot of technical processes. And some of the fields are pretty new. When we think about the gearbox in the big wind energy turbines, uh, and they are having specific demand. So we see it's a pretty huge field, and there is still development going on. Like I explained, for example, in wind turbines, you have in the gearbox something like 400, 500 liter engine oil. And actually, you don't want to exchange it too often. So there are, for there are additives uh, in this uh, oil which are long-lasting but maintain the same performance over a long period of time. Yeah. So the function of a lubricant is, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, keeping moving parts away, so reducing uh, the friction, 
transfer the heat, uh, especially in combustion engines or when you have frictions. And then they carry away contaminants like uh, uh, water, but also small particles, and they prevent corrosion. So, and this is not just done by a hydrocarbon. Uh, we need a lot of uh, modifiers like molybdenum, zinc, uh, uh, soap uh, contents. And some elements, of course, will tell us uh, uh, about the, the engine performance and the engine or parts of the engine uh, which might fail in, in the future. So therefore, the ele elemental analyze is pretty important and it can involve a lot of cost. So I guess, uh, as you can see here, lubricants are really can really, really high-tech uh, products, no? Mm -hmm. but, I guess, but I guess there are also specific norms, again, no? Yeah, I mean, actually, in, uh, we, we all know that uh, when you have an uh, engine, you're looking at the back of your bottle and you see different specifications. And they are tested uh, just following those norms. Some of them are described as ED norms, like the uh, 6481 but others are wavelength dispersive based uh, 6443 and they typically cover the entire elements which are involved as additives but also the concentration range which can be from low ppm up to several percent and so therefore we see here also the different instruments which can be used. Yeah, Adrian, maybe you explain the use of a benchtop energy dispersive instrument for lubricating oils. Yes, so one example that we can do here like is the ASTM D7751, which is uh, additive in lubricant uh, with an energy dispersive system. In this case, our direct excitation S2 Puma. Uh, we can see here already a table with the results. No worries about that. You will get the slides later, so you can also di digest those numbers later. But uh, for this kind of application, direct exam, uh, excitation is really really uh, helpful and you can get um, all these elements like magnesium, uh, sulfur, chlorine really down to uh, low concentration levels and at very high precision. So the Esther Puma can really fulfill the needs here. Yeah. Yeah. Means the high precision uh, is especially required because in the recipe for an engine oil you typically have a minimum value and a maximum value specified yeah. so when blending an oil you want to be as precise as possible, but since some of the components are pretty expensive, you don't want to spend in excess. So therefore, to ensure that you're in specification, it's yeah. better to be precise, but not wasting too much of chemicals. Um, yeah, therefore, precision counts. Yeah, so one number here you want to look out for are these really low standard deviations that you can achieve here with this tool. Of course, there's also other um, applications for the S2 Puma. Um, and that can be wear metal detection, so uh, basically prediction uh, of, of uh, engine or let's say uh, um, wear down uh, engine failure. Uh, one uh, trace element that you have here is chromium. Kai mentioned it. Uh, you can see here on Kai's side that we have really a very low background, covering here a wide range of concentrations for chromium and can really nicely determine this chromium content in the engine oil. Um, just a few words about the, the Aster Puma here. You can see a picture. It also comes with different configurations, single and X by auto changer for higher workloads. Uh, we are covering different norms uh, in the lubricant business. It's mostly the uh, one that I showed, so the 7751, but also the uh, 6481. Um, we, we are not only measuring um, uh, single elements, so it's again a multi-element analyzer that can cover almost the entire periodic table, uh, and we can of course also look into uh, uh, wear metals. However, there's, uh, there's also examples when, when you need a bit more, um, and uh, the by far most extended norm here uh, that, that uh, is available there uh, for, for additives, wear metals, and even contaminants in lubricants is the uh, DEAN 51399, uh, which is also currently being updated, has been released in 2010. Um, it has the first part, which is an ICP section, and the second part is a wavelength dispersive section. So here we're using wavelength dispersive samples, and just stepping here aside a bit. So we also can provide the necessary standards to calibrate, to factory calibrate the device according to 
this norm, uh, including uh, drift control and quality control samples. So with our wavelength dispersive systems, you are ready uh, for this task, for this um, challenging but very broad norm. Um, an example here, so the STX Jaguar once again is our benchtop system. So very compact wavelength dispersive system, but very powerful. And if you look into the details of, of the, the QC measurements here um, for, for freshly prepared samples, so this is basically sample every time, so every th effect is included, the weighing is included, maybe a slight mispreparation of the cup or so, everything is included and you still get an extraordinary uh, standard deviation here. You see an example over here, 0.5% uh, for, for ein, for example, um, with the S6 Jaguar. Yeah, so actually one can imagine that an S2 Puma is maybe something in a maintenance center for big uh, building engines like the Caterpillars where in, uh, before you make an oil exchange on the engine you are, you are looking at uh, the oil and see the condition or uh, you are running a cement uh, factory but you are using uh, grease or oil uh, uh, look at your mill and the bearings and then you, you would see the friction um, here, uh, the Jaguar with the Dean uh, 51399 is maybe something for uh, engine testing companies or, or central labs close to engine testing or engine development. So this is where we typically find those uh, uh, instruments, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so now, but Kai, we also sometimes need a bit more gear. And that brings us to the floor standing device here right next to me, so the SA Tiger. So maybe you can play, explain us a bit more when that's needed. Yeah, means we, we see that uh, here is a picture of a refinery. It's a big operation, and we can imagine a central lab would see uh, many, many samples. means uh, something can be shift samples from uh, the products, uh, incoming inspection of crude oil, but also, as we said, uh, could be catalyst materials or pet coke, which is currently also a quite valuable uh, product to be sold uh, for, for energy generation or cement plants. And so one instrument needs to carry a lot of jobs and uh, is calibrated for different matrices. So here we see that the SA Tiger is a very flexible instrument and it can be also used for additives and wear metals. And uh, one of the things when we look at the broad range of applications, it's very time consuming and labor and cost intensive to calibrate the machine. So you can get the SA Tiger with a general calibration. It's uh, called PetroQuant. And it's actually a universal expert calibration. It comes factory installed. And nicely, it can be fine-tuned to your application uh, and, and split into different, uh, different methods. So this is the one thing. So it covers about 32 elements. Um, and this is a very nice box coming with the setup standards, with the quality uh, standards, and um, also drift creation in some consumables. And the nice thing, uh, yeah, you can start with, with fuels, lubricants, additives in polymers and plastics, um, toxic elements according to rose, uh, pet coke, as we said, or alternative fuels. So you can cover with PetroQuant quite a huge range of applications. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe one, one key feature that to emphasize here also, you can even use the calibrated lines that are here for certain elements and combine them with our standardless approach. So this is, this is a really powerful tool if you, if you want to look into broad applications with one package. There is expert knowledge behind this method uh, as we speak. I mean, uh, the one thing is uh, sulfur can be pretty low in concentration, can be pretty high, like in crude oil up to 2-3%. And so, therefore, the uh, uh, software includes a mechanism to automatically select the best line, so uh, the trace line or the, the major line. On the other hand, also, when we have used engine oils or pet coke, we have oxygen in, which is, has an influence, especially on trace elements, on accuracy. And so, we have a method called automatic, and it quantifies the light matrix. And also we correct for the sample effects, the meniscus geometric effects. Uh, and so this is quite a huge expert knowledge uh, behind the curtain of this software.
So overall, this solution makes really use of all the different features, uh, not only hardware but software features in our system. It is not just a black box method. Uh, you, you can also uh, modify it for your needs, and but but you get something really pristine from day one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so the nice thing here, uh, Petroquan has been used by Formula One and NASCAR racing teams during engine development and also when uh, before the race uh, testing engine oil. And so we have used Petroquan in fine-tuned making a method uh, for racing uh, cars. And uh, so here we strip down the analyze time to 10 minutes. Um, uh, looking at uh, the very high precision for the very light elements because they are used in those race, uh, racing uh, car engines. And what we want to see is um, a change in the concentration as early as possible. So we need precision and we need the automatic uh, matrix correction feature uh, to, to uh, access the oxygen concentration because depending on the age, of uh, the oil, the oxygen concentration can be quite different. And uh, when we look here, uh, that's the 10 ppm standards, and we see here for elements like titanium, chromium, uh, manganese, which are coming from bearing and piston uh, parts, actually, we see a, a low, uh, below zero ppm, uh, below 0 0.5 ppm precision. And that's really excellent. So whenever we see a change in those elements, we would see it early and can predict the engine lifetime, basically. Yeah, here you can see in this example, you can see the power then of a, of a fully blown system, which really reaches yet another level in terms mm -hmm. of precision and uh, especially for very low traces. It's so maybe now, uh, Kai, you can just summarize it up for, for the SA Tiger bit. Yeah. yeah. It means the, the SI Tiger is, is really the instrument of choice for wavelength dispersive sequential high power instruments in the petrochemicals. On the one hand, we have low cost of ownership. Um, yeah, we have a very low consumption of helium. We have two modes, uh, one for fuel, one for lubricants, um, and, and so making a great deal in saving uh, the valuable helium. We have high instrument uptime, and this is thanks to sample care. We are protecting the uh, most important instrument uh, uh, parts, like the X-ray tube or the goniometer, and we have a very low temperature X-ray tube head. And this is pretty important because um, uh, samples like fuel uh, will uh, affect the data quality and the instrument performance when, um, uh, uh, when spoiled uh, in the instrument. And yeah, we achieve lowest levels of detection below 1 ppm for most of the elements. It covers a very wide concentration range as we spoke uh, from traces and um, uh, major elements, different applications like we've shown additives and wear metals. And we also support nice features like this new gas-free detector, the Hisense GF. It's a sealed uh, proportional counter which uh, covers the element range uh, from very light elements like fluorine up to um, uh, iron and actually doesn't require any P10 gas which is also critical in handling. So that's a brand new detector and it gets, um, yeah, helps you to get rid of P10 gas. And this is a great deal. And I guess we now switch over back to Renata to the application lab to have a closer look to the SA Tiger and how the instrument runs. Exactly, so see you later for the Q&A session. Hello and welcome back to our second lab session. Now I would like to introduce you the SH Tiger, our floor standing wavelength dispersive system. And I would like to tell you a little bit more uh, details about our PetroQuant package. This system here is our application system. It's available with or without touchscreen, so this is still an option. And the system is available in different configurations. One kilowatt, three kilowatt and four kilowatt system. The big advantage of the one kilowatt system, which is typically quite enough for the petrochemical applications, is that we do not need external cooling. So it's just air cooled. Yeah, so this is quite nice. Compared to the 3 or 4 kilowatt system, the measurement time is a little bit 
higher compared to the big, bigger system. This system is also available with different loader configurations, so let's have a look. What we see here is the easy loader configuration. So this is the typical configuration for petrochemical customers. So we have these little cups. The liquid cup is easily put into the sample cup. And the big advantage of this configuration is that the grabber will detect the liquid cup. So as soon as a liquid cup is detected, it's not possible to run a vacuum measurement. So the system will run the samples or the liquid or the powder samples under a helium mode. Typically for gasoline samples um, or for diesel samples with the atmospheric pressure and to save helium for mineral oil samples, we use a reduced pressure for the helium mode. The grabber will pick up the sample and will load it to the sample position. So the Sample chamber is quite small, it's maybe a, a volume like a fist, and this makes also helium consumption um, much lower than with the big chamber. And the big advantage after each measurement, the chamber is flushed with air again, so this avoids the system of having the so called high sulfur memory effect, which time is very important for petrochemical customers. If we talk about sample preparation, so as we have already seen, the sample preparation for liquid cups on the S2 Polar, here it's exactly the same. Uh, sometimes uh, grease is a topic, so if you want to prepare a grease sample or if you want to analyze the grease samples, what we use here are pellets which are based on organic materials. So you can easily fill in a dedicated amount of grease onto the pellet. I already prepared a sample. So here, this is the pellet with the grease on top of it. And then this pellet can easily be put into a liquid cup like this. And then you can analyze the liquid cup as you have already done it with a liquid sample. That's it. If we talk about petrochemical applications, we have a very great tool, a ready-to-use solution, which is a global solution for these kind of applications, which is called PetroQuant. So PetroQuant contains, on one side, the big calibration, which includes 32 elements, which can be used to be analyzed liquids, mineral oil, gasoline samples, but of course it can also be used to analyze polymer discs or polymer granules, and grease samples can be analyzed too. Another uh, application which can be used uh, for the PetroQuant solution is, for example, the analysis of alternative fuels, like, for example, in cement industry. For each PetroQuant installation, the PetroQuant package includes a set of drift samples, quality check samples, and alignment samples which are used to set up the method. Typically, the method is already pre-installed, so you can immediately use it after the system is installed. But PetroQuant also includes uh, different dedicated norms, so you can extend the PetroQuant package to ISTM norms or D norms, which are relevant for you. So this can be included, and so you also have dedicated norms which are already installed on the system, and you can immediately start with analyzing the samples. And of course, you are norm compliant. But a good thing on PetroQuant, it's not only a black box, so you can easily also adapt it. This means you can, for example, shorten a measurement time. You can also shorten, uh, for example, the list of elements if you want to have a faster measurement. Uh, but you can also extend measurement time in case you also want to uh, analyze smaller sample uh, mass or if you want to improve LLDs. This can also be done. And of course, you can mix um, quantitative method or lines, elements, with the standardless software. So this means it's a quite flexible tool for the user, so it's not only a black box. So, I hope you enjoyed our laboratory session today. Let's go back to the studio. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much, Renata. And with this, I'd like to briefly summarize the seminar. 
We have shown how powerful elemental analysis with XRF is and how it enables fast and reliable analysis of petrochemicals. One of the key advantages is the quick sample preparation without any chemicals needed. And also the only one-time calibration which is necessary and the long-time stability of the instruments. The S2 Polar, an instrument based on polarized EDXF technology, is suitable for ultra-low sulfur determination in different petrochemicals in a very compact device. The analysis takes only minutes and is in accordance to the ASTM D7220. And with its multi-element uh, capability, the system is also suitable for measuring a number of other uh, applications in refineries and in the downstream segment. The S2 Puma is a suitable instrument for the lubricating oil analysis, for example in accordance to ASTM D6481 or 7751, but can also be used for the metal operation analysis, for example for lead, copper or iron. The S6 Jaguar and compact benchtop WDXF instrument is really suitable for petrochemical labs for the analysis for sulfur and automotive fuels, for example, in accordance to ASTM D2622 or ISO 2884, and also for the lubricant analysis in accordance to ASTM D6443, for example. Last but not least, the SA Tiger, our floor standing WDXF system, really for the highest throughput and best analytical performance in demanding central labs. And especially in the combination with the PetroQuant Petro solution and the ICR analysis of 32 elements possible, including miners and traces in crude oils, in fuels, and greases, polymers, and plastics. And with this, I'd like to now hand over to the Q&A session with our experts. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, now thank you for the summary, Frank. Now we are here for the Q&A session to answer your question. And I hear from Kai that there are already quite a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we saw, we saw this, I guess, um, a little bit on the topic. Um, first, technology. The first question you have asked, uh, what are the possibilities of the use of uh, smaller basic benchtop XRF uh, in petrochemicals? Yeah, so, I mean, um, the smaller devices can also handle a lot of tasks normally. Um, this, so this is not limited uh, just to what we focused on, uh, sulfur and ultra-low sulfur but also chlorine. You can also measure uh, additives and um, even wear metals, but especially the wear metals, then not to the, to the lowest limits. No? Yeah, means and, and the, the S2 Polar, of course, the, the instrument itself can also be used for non-oil samples, so maybe yeah. catalyst or, or something, or in, in, in the S2 Puma, for example, for, for metal or whatever, so there's no restriction and the standardless mode of the, the uh, benchtop and floor standing XRF instruments will also handle those materials, yeah. right? Yeah. The measurement times uh, for especially ultra-low sulfur, this is a question which has come up. Yeah, so for ultra-low sulfur with the S2 Polar, we typically count uh, 300 seconds, so that's five minutes. Um, sample handling, few mm -hmm. few seconds on top there. Yeah. Yeah means the wavelength dispersal of the high power unit sometimes just needs uh, 60 seconds. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, the reason the high power enables the, the short measurement time. And, um, yeah, so that's one of the advantages and reasons uh, to, to choose a, a bigger system, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, quite interesting uh, question is we talked about mylar and we talked about proline foil. The question is, can we interchange those foils? Um, yeah, so normally you have the ideal foil for a certain material. Um, uh, you don't interchange with an, a method. Um, that being said, in mylar, for example, you, you can have some, some um, 
tiny differences between the mylar samples. So normally, so in our methods, we have a blank correction for the, these differences in the mylar foil. And so when you get a new batch of mylar foil, you can correct for that. Yeah. Yeah, it means uh, the standardless uh, options or the petrocon options always also take the foil into account. So actually, when you change the preparation to the new foil, then the, the uh, effect will be considered uh, during the evaluation. So it, it, uh, it depends if you have a material-specific calibration yeah. and you just focus on one, one uh, and you define one uh, uh, preparation, then actually you would uh, need a new setup uh, if you change for it. Yeah. If you change supplier or new batch, like Adrian pointed out, uh, you simply can run the blank sample and then it will be taken into account. When we look for standards, international standards, the ASTM uh, 7551 actually handles uh, an oxygen or not? <coughs> yeah, yeah, it does. So we use the Compton uh, effect there uh, to determine uh, essentially or the crack for the oxygen effect on, on the measurements. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so this is uh, as well quite important. Uh, and if you and looking for the best accuracy, then we need to take uh, into account the, the oxygen, the influence of oxygen. And this is especially important for used oil samples. Mm -hmm. and, and 7551 is actually a fresh oil uh, and, 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 uh, standard, but actually in the moment you are running used oil, oxidized uh, oil, then actually this comes into play. And the effect can be a few ppm, so mm -hmm. there can be quite a huge difference in, in the uh, results. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to know more about the XRF application determining contaminant levels in waste cooking oil, and, um, so uh, vegetable oils and biodiesels. Uh, main interest is sulfur and chlorine. Can we point this out? Yeah, so we haven't focused today on this, but uh, of course our, our devices can also use, uh, I also use for used cooking oils that is later then refined into uh, uh, biofuels. Here, of course, we are dealing with, with, uh, with samples that can be a bit diverse. They have different original sources in terms of what is the vegetable oil originally. There can be influences from, from the, let's say, the, the biological effect, the soil, whatever contaminated it in between. So here we, we, have, we are dealing with different uh, levels on, of contaminants, of different types of contaminants, mm -hmm. for example, also silicon. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, so there, there's one question uh, regarding the future of XRF, uh, especially when looking into the future with uh, uh, the, the changes in the source of uh, the, the hydrocarbons. Uh, like the biofuels, uh, will XRF still be uh, important? Um, yes, I mean, basically, the, this, it will, will always be important here um, because especially when we are migrating to, uh, let's say, renewable fuels, it could be also synthetic fuels and, and biofuels, we are introducing different challenges. And we still need to make sure that um, these materials are pure enough to be burned in an engine, so to make sure that the engine is not compromised, no corrosion happens, so chlorine is still a topic, for example. We need to make sure that the exhaust, like it would, we don't put too much sulfur in the air. And it's actually even more complex because um, when we have the crude oil refined to, to a petrochemical product, this path is very clear. We know what we're putting in at the beginning. We have a really refined product in the end. Here we have more ways to basically um, create uh, different uh, contaminations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Means as we pointed out, uh, lubricants uh, will still be important, even looking at EV. Yeah. Uh, for example, means uh, uh, lubricating uh, is the key for, for performance and for reliability operation of the EV as well. We have talked about these uh, wind uh, generators, the big mm -hmm. gearboxes filled with very special lubricating oil. And the same would be synthetic fuels or biofuels uh, due to the uh, technical processes. There will be m much more elements uh, Im important, not only the sulfur, uh, the chlorine, the phosphorus, the silicon we talked yeah. about. There will be catalyst elements as well coming up, yeah. uh, which are not yet a topic. And, and we can offer the petroquant there. 
Maybe. Yeah, exactly. And even polymers I mean products from petrochemicals, if you want. So we are talking yeah. about re biodegradable, recyclable polymers. Mm -hmm. This means new polymer products that also need to be monitored. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, our guess uh, and our advice would be to look at uh, not just a small XOF, which can do just sulfur, but look more for them uh, more powerful, more flexible units because they can easily adapt with simply a new application for future tasks, right? Um, let me quickly check. Uh, um, da, da, da. How then does we, how do we treat matrix and different matrices uh, in in complex programs like Petroquant, uh, especially looking at this waste oils and things like this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you describe this a little bit? Or yeah, again? I mean. Um, Basically, our, our systems can deal with matrix corrections. The one, one effect that we already named it a bit is, is, is the oxygen effect that can have a small impact simply because it sits close to the elements of interest mm -hmm. and the variation already uh, poses some impact on, on, let's say, the background, for example. So there we can deal with various matrices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, this almost covers uh, the entire range of questions. Um, yeah, so then let's uh, come to the end. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for your participation. We really appreciate uh, your contribution, uh, pointing out these interesting questions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, looking forward uh, for the next uh, seminar with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same from my side. So also, like, we know that there are a couple questions coming beforehand. And during the session, if you still ask questions, we typically compile a your question answer document, which you get afterwards with the most important questions for you. Yeah. And then you also get the slides, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So enjoy the day and yeah, looking forward to see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.